Hi, I'm John Whitledge of Whitledge with Whitledge Designs, and today I'm here with Steve McCormack, legendary audio component designer. Thank you. Whose whose career has spanned more than thirty years. He's most probably best known for the uh, commercialization and uh, manufacturing of tiptoes and the DNA line of amplifiers, which are highly regarded and are very relevant even today, which were designed almost 20 years ago. Tiptoes being the uh, the pointed feet that you see under so many high-end audio components, uh, both speakers and electronics. Almost ubiquitous now. Almost, under, yeah. Underneath almost everything. Yeah. The uh, Steve's uh, career has covered retail sales, uh, manufacturing, equipment design, recording, mixing, editing, mastering. Um, he's worked with Jim Murad's Blueport Jazz label and recorded and uh, made CDs of some of the best jazz musicians in the industry under the Blueport Jazz label. And uh, he founded SMC Audio in, uh, well, the DNA line was, of course, under McCormick Audio. McCormick Audio started in the late 80s. Late 80s, yeah. yeah. And then uh, SMC Audio was founded in... Uh, About 98. 98. And yeah. principally, the work is focused on developing your new uh, reference level. Well, that and doing the upgrade work on my earlier gear, which would be sort of like a, a speed shop for cars, in, in yeah. would be the analogy. Uh, people send me... Um, the earlier amplifiers and preamplifiers, which I rebuild for even higher levels of performance. So SMC Audio has been dedicated to that, but then more recently um, I've gotten back into doing reference level component design. By that I mean no holds barred, my statement pieces. I get to, to build the best things that I uh, possibly can. So that's uh, come out in the form of the VRE1 preamplifier, the reference preamp. Well, I can assure the listeners of Car Audio and Electronics, or the readers of Car Audio and Electronics magazine, that uh, the VRE1 is really something. I mean, you look under the hood, it's the best of everything, and you listen to it, and it's a sonic revelation. And it's not just me saying that, it's the entire industry. So congratulations on that VRE1. Thank you very much. That's um, been uh... A long, a long labor. How many of love. years was that? Well, it took about uh, six years, probably, oh depending God. on how you'd like to define it. But uh, that was the most difficult thing I've I've ever done, uh, because I wanted to make a product that didn't simply sound good, but really, as much as possible, got out of the way, um, did not impose its own character, did not limit anything in the original recording, just really got to the the truth of what was in the original recording without any editorializing or adding or subtracting. Um, it's uh, when you try to push it to the limit of what's possible, that becomes a very difficult proposition. I could have stopped anywhere along the line and said, well, it's good enough, but uh, we're both here because we're perfectionists. <laughs> so uh, um, that's kind of the, you know, the part of it that was, uh, that was challenging and fun was to keep pushing it to that point where I thought I had finally succeeded in achieving all of my goals. But it took a long time. It was a very difficult uh, road. So. It's, it's an amazing piece. I mean, would you like to talk about some of the innovations of that piece? Oh, um, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, but okay. Uh, I, I, first of all, I want to thank Ben O, the, uh, the editor of um, the Car Audio and Electronics magazine, for giving me this opportunity uh, to address you folks. Um, and the whole reason that we're here, of course, is because of John's work in the car audio field and his, uh, his work with the so-called magic bus, um, <laughs> trying to make the very best possible, the highest performance possible, um, mobile audio system. And the degree to which that begins to um, be comparable to a fine home audio system. Normally the, the worlds of home audio and car audio uh, don't really overlap very much. Um, we have some common interests certainly in, in how we listen to music or our, our love for music, um, but cars are inherently a very different environment than the home. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, you don't, there, there's a lot of people who are home audiophile hobbyists and car audiophile hobbyists 
and uh, there's a little overlap. Some, sometimes you find some people who are both, uh, but most of the time they're kind of different worlds. Uh, so it's interesting uh, for us to talk about this because uh, of the work that John has done in the Magic Bus uh, has largely been to control the acoustics of that environment, which has been a very difficult effort mm. uh, to make it more like, well, it goes actually well beyond a typical home and more to a, like a studio environment, very controlled acoustics, which has uh, taken up a lot of, of your work with the, um, uh, the custom fitted uh, acoustic control components of the van. And then uh, the, uh, the speakers, the, all of the custom work in uh, designing and building and integrating the, uh, the speaker system. Uh, so uh, I got involved with John uh, because he was looking to me um, for some guidance in getting the best possible sound. But his point of view had to do more with um, what we hear in a good home system. Um, and he wanted me to, uh, you know, to bring my expertise to bear on that part of the equation. Uh, he was used to doing competing in the car audio arena, but, you know, the philosophy or the point of view is somewhat different. So he came to me and said, you know, how does this stack up from uh, from your point of view? And so uh, from my perspective as a uh, uh, recording and mastering engineer and uh, an equipment designer who, you know, works with... Um, very neutral, very accurate, wide dynamic range uh, systems in the home and in my studio. Um, it was uh, quite different. And so we talked about those differences and how, uh, what he might have to do in order to, um, uh, to change it, to make it more like a good home audio system, which led ultimately to the, to the development of the Magic Bus, which has been a long mm -hmm. and difficult road for, uh, for John because it's a, he's put a phenomenal amount of work um, into, into the Magic Bus. Um, and uh, it's just now finally essentially completed or 98% yeah, completed or racing. something. Yeah, we're down to sort of the final. Some say it'll never be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, yeah, it's an ongoing project. Yeah. Uh, but um, no, we're, we're getting pretty darn close. And uh, it really is uh, an incredible thing to, to hear um, because it does so many things incredibly well and in many respects goes even well beyond what you normally find in a home system from the standpoint of uh, dynamic impact and power in the bass, um, especially, it's, uh, it's right up there with the best of anything that I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. and, and just in overall uh, uh, characteristics, it's uh, in, extraordinarily good. So my hat's off to you wow, for all you. of the work that you've done in that. It's an amazing, an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. And uh, you, you should be very proud of all the work that you've done on it. Oh, thanks. I, the readers of Car Audio Electronics magazine um, probably are familiar with my first van, which was featured in an article entitled Weird Science. And it was a Volkswagen Eurovan with Dynaudio loudspeakers and Macintosh um, equipment. And that's what Steve heard in about 2004 when I first um, met Steve. Uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show, mm -hmm. and Steve graciously invited me to his uh, laboratory and graciously offered to take a listen to it. And his comments and his inspiration um, basically led me to the conclusion that I had to start from scratch, despite the fact that this was a reasonably uh, good good system and, a, and won many trophies. I, I realized that if I wanted to take it to the next level and and get serious about audio, I had to start from scratch. And that's what led to the Mercedes van. Um, and then this uh, six year journey to, to try to finish it. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, some, some of the readers would probably are curious if, to know if you've ever owned a uh, home audio system or a car audio system. And if, uh, if you have um, any experience in that regard. Well, uh, I have to confess honestly that I have very little experience in that regard. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, there there hasn't been a lot of overlap between car audio and home audio, even though fundamentally a lot of our interests are, are the same or very similar. Um, but uh, I did some work in cars um, back, this goes back a long time when I was uh, selling equipment back in the 1970s. And I just, you know, I didn't like working in cars or working on cars. It just, for whatever reason, didn't fit my uh, my personality and my my preferences. So I enjoyed working in the home, um, doing uh, uh, home hobbyist audio, and that's where my focus has always been. So um, I've never put any special emphasis on my car audio system. I, I, I enjoy listening to music when I'm traveling, uh, but for me that can be anything from a typical car radio to uh, my uh, iPhone, uh, you know, uh, with some headphones on or something like that. So I like music in the car, but um, I haven't gone out of my way to make a, a special car audio system. Uh, as you know very well, I've spent endless time and energy doing home audio and uh, setting up uh, my mastering studio, and and I'm, uh, I'm constantly working on those sorts of things. Uh, so that's where my focus has been. Do you think that some of that... I mean, historically, in the early days, we had um, equalizers, but they were of analog nature, mm -hmm. and there was no digital time delay. So the car, maybe the car audio was limited a little bit in the beginning, and then maybe with the advent of some modern technology like DSP, including time alignment and equalization, mm -hmm. do you think that um, you know is helping car audio to uh, progress? to the point where it it can be better than it used to be? Um, I think that the modern technologies that you're talking about, especially the DSP-based systems, are a phenomenal improvement um, over the old analog stuff of the past. Um, and this is, another, this is an interesting departure between home audio and car audio uh, because equalizers have always been an important part of car audio. And I probably all the readers will remember, uh, I don't know how far back we have to go, mm -hmm. but most you know, uh, advanced car audio systems had a multi-band equalizer you know, built right in or part of the deal where people could EQ the, um, uh, the net result for their particular uh, car and their taste. Uh, but that was still a relatively crude way to do it. Yeah. Whereas now you have very accurate DSP EQ, uh, oftentimes parametric, in nature and time delay as well as you say. Um, this may only show up to the user as a kind of a tone control interface, um, but for more advanced um, users with more advanced systems, they will have uh, some sort of an interface that gives them access to the power of that DSP to control uh, the parameters in their, in their car very, uh, um, in a very accurate, detailed, Kind of way, so yeah, it's a hugely powerful tool, and uh, uh, allows uh, makes it much easier to overcome a lot of the inherent limitations of cars as an environment mm. for good sound. When when um, I guess continuing along those same lines, it seems that home audiophiles typically eschew the use of equalization and processing and and things, and their belief is that. Th those the use of those things may interfere with the sonic purity of the system and mm -hmm. um so what maybe you could comment on the pros i mean i my some of my reading has shown that if if you do actually um correct the frequency response you are actually improving the phase and you are actually um, improving mm -hmm. what what you hear in the environment in which you're hearing it so could you talk about maybe some of the pros and cons as you've seen it, of, yeah. you know, and maybe, you know, what, what your thoughts are on that? Well, it's an interesting point of difference, again, between uh, home audio as a hobby and, and car audio and recording in the world of musicians. And um, home audio is a kind of a special case where the emphasis um, for a number of years now has tended to be on purity, simplicity and purity. That's not always the case. I'm generalizing, but um, that's why when you when we get into the realm of what we would call high-end audio electronics, um, the 
preamplifiers or integrated amplifiers typically don't have tone controls anymore. And indeed, um, it's been difficult for manufacturers to, to sell any products that have those things built in. Again, in the realm of what we're talking about is high-end audio, when you get to receivers and other more typical integrated amplifiers, they will still often have basic tone controls. But until you get really into the area of modern DSP based systems uh, where you begin to see some extremely powerful EQing tools again and things like room correction, active room correction and that sort of thing, you don't find much interest from home audiophiles. Uh, they're concerned about um, purity for lack of a better term and they're concerned that adding additional, especially analog circuitry, um, may compromise the, uh, the transparency and clarity of their systems. Um, and a lot of home audiophiles still have a concern about uh, DSP-based systems because if they're going from an analog domain to a digital domain, back to an analog domain, or have to make the conversions mm -hmm. between analog and digital, a lot of people find this worrisome. They, they feel like they're going to be losing some quality there. and. And I think those, um, those feelings and those opinions are based in some fact going back into the past, but I don't think it's really true or doesn't need to be true any longer. Um, the, uh, the tools that are now available and are becoming more available are uh, the DSP-based digital systems are extraordinarily powerful. And I can think of a number of examples now where there are mixed signal systems going from analog to digital and back again, where the net outcome, the final result is among some of the finest sound I've ever heard mm. in my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been shown very dramatically that, that um, degradation need not be part of that equation. And so I think that um, moving forward, um, more ho home audio Base systems will begin to include more options for EQing and, and control of various parameters in the playback, which will be ultimately good for, for everybody. But the irony of this is that it's taking um, computer-based playback systems, modern music servers, and the growth of that aspect of the industry to make that possible. Um, and I suppose, ironically, these kinds of tools may first become more commonly available in lower end equipment mm -hmm. um, because the larger companies, the big uh, multinational conglomerates have the resources to make this stuff at you know relatively low cost and, and to incorporate these kinds of tools um, because they put a you know a DSP chip in there that's got the power to do it. So why not go ahead and do these things? So I mean that includes even active room correction becomes relatively simple to do those things and to and not very expensive to include them. Um, but up at the very high end, you still have people with um, uh, tube and solid state equipment that's all analog and uh, very straight line, um, mm -hmm. uh, not including any processing or effects. And that's still the way most people want that. Um, it's interesting for me as a recording engineer and a mastering engineer because I sort of wear different hats depending on what I'm doing. When, I, when I'm wearing my audiophile hat and do, going for music playback, my system is very simple and straight line and pure. But when I'm editing and mastering music, I depend on some very sophisticated uh, computer-based tools, including um, equalizers, um, and, you know, parametric EQ, and uh, um, uh, tools that shape the sound, and uh, may add ambient um, reverberation patterns and things like that. Some that depend on very powerful DSP-based uh, uh, computing software to make that all work. Um, so maybe there's a little irony there, uh, but we try. You know, we're we're trying to keep the recordings as pure, quote unquote, and as true to the original as possible. But in order to do that, sometimes we have to do some rather sophisticated processing to correct problems that you know, are inherent in the original recording and, and to, uh, uh, to make the final result sound as close to the original as possible. 
-hmm. So DSP, modern DSP tools are, um, are becoming more, uh, more common, more important. And, uh, they, the average, uh, car user, you know, custom car user and installer may be very much at home with those things. Now, the average home audio file is, has still got a ways to go to learn more about those, but that's happening, I think pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, I think we will ultimately will come full circle probably in a few more years where home audio files, because of, you know, the computer based servers that they have, will have access to a, a form of equalization and tone control, if you will, that harkens back to the old days, um, when it was analog, but now it will be all digital and they'll have the ability to make subtle or, or, uh, large corrections to the uh, uh, playback in their systems, either as just a matter of taste or to correct for room problems, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, I think we'll ultimately all be on the same page there. That le maybe that leads into my next question, which is um, um, some people think that sound quality is a subjective um, sort of quality. Uh, other people think that there are objective measures of sound quality that are, you know, essentially undeniable. Um, my experience, and, and especially after getting to know you, is that it takes a little bit of both. And in fact, uh, when I was um, adjusting my system to what I thought was representing reasonable measured performance, I, I had asked for your opinion of the sound. And uh you really you had enhanced the involvement the listener involvement and the lifelike nature of the sound and and to that end um when robert harley listened to my system he also uh held it in high regard and gave a mm -hmm. great deal of praise to it so uh the question is you know really how subjective is good sound quality and um you know how how do we know when we've, what do you, how do you know when you've achieved um, sound quality that is most lifelike and most involving and what things do you consider as you go through that? Um, well, of course, this is, as you know, a very controversial yeah. issue. Yeah. And uh, we see a lot of uh, flame wars <laughs> on the various uh, websites um, over this very issue. And there's a longstanding very acrimonious some debate sometimes uh, between the um, engineering or objective community and the uh, uh, the audiophile subjective uh, community. But the the truth in my mind, of course, is what you said uh, originally that both are in fact true. Both things are necessary ultimately for uh, for the best possible playback. There are a number of things that you can measure. And as an equipment designer, and certainly as a speaker designer, uh, those measurements play a very important role in getting your design worked out, getting problems and kinks ironed out, figuring out, you know, establishing a baseline of performance, knowing where you are to be sure you can get to where you want to go. Uh, but once you get to a point where something is measuring fairly well uh, or even very well, there are still um, subjective uh, aspects of the performance that um, are that don't don't lend themselves well to um, uh, measurement analysis or objective analysis, purely objective analysis, certainly in my opinion. Um, after all, I mean, in the end, we're we're consumers of this stuff, and our response to these things is subjective and emotional. Um, and uh, you know, as you know from my work with you, um, sometimes some some fairly subtle changes in um, the uh, crossover point and slope and relative levels of drivers mm -hmm. um, can have a very important change in the the net outcome, the the way everything integrates and works together, and this sense of what we call engagement or involvement in the music. Um, it's very tricky to make a, a full range system 
fully coherent, where it, it speaks with the same voice all the way from the bottom to the top. Um, and there are some pretty subtle issues sometimes that uh, um, have to do with getting the balances just right to where you get that sense of engagement and involvement. Um, and those, those things, uh, if we measured those differences, if we measured the system response before and after, we wouldn't see much difference in those measurements, if anything at all. Mm -hmm. Or if, even if we did see a difference, if that's what we were working from, we wouldn't be able to choose. We, we wouldn't, just from the uh, analysis, the measurement itself, we wouldn't necessarily be able to choose which one gave us the better result. We have to sit and, and listen for that. And that's where my body of experience is paying off. Um, not only just the amount, the sheer amount of time I've had in the, in the industry, but um, my recording and mastering work pays off a lot here because um, I'm more um, in tune with um, what's going on at specific frequencies. I have enough knowledge of speaker design and what goes into that and the electronics, you know, behind it to, uh, to be able to interpret what I'm hearing and make a useful comment about what needs to be changed to move from where we are to where we want to be. And uh, so that's um, where, you know, my expertise maybe sets me apart from the average listener. Um, maybe a typical listener could sit there and go, you know, gee, it's, it's good. Uh, you know, the, the bass is great. There's all kinds of parts of it that are really outstanding, but you know, somehow it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't quite move me or something. Whereas I can, you know, listen and go, well, okay, we're, um, you know, we're getting some added distortion from the mid range driver because the crossover point is too high or, um, you know, the, we need to adjust this or that. And then a uh, little bit of EQ has to be, you know, a, a three quarters of a dB dip at seven kilohertz. I can be a little more specific about uh, what changes need to take place in order to, uh, to get the, the desired result. Um, so that's, uh, uh, I think, what has made my, my work uh, and help useful. Oh, yeah. that's been profoundly helpful to my system. I know as a, as a, an aspiring audiophile who, who has much to learn, I took your advice and, of course, listened to as much live music as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a pretty good idea, as maybe most of the readers of Car Audio Electronics magazine maybe do, what live music sounds like. And you know... It's right when you hear it, but the part where I struggled was knowing, okay, if it's not right, what is the cause of it not right. sounding like mm -hmm. live music, and and what parameters do I need to change to achieve, you know, to achieve a correction or or to achieve a, right. a more optimum lifelike sound. And yeah. you've done a tremendous amount of work with the, um, the the analysis and measurement part of it, um, using a very uh, high-powered, sophisticated tools, calibrated microphones, and, and analysis gear to, uh, to help you um, get all of the basics right, get the fundamentals of the design right, uh, work out the, um, uh, the major crossover points, damping characteristics, time delays, all mm -hmm. of those things, you know, for this custom, very sophisticated custom speaker system that's in the van. And uh, all of that forms the uh, fundamental basis for making good sound in, in the end. Uh, but as you've discovered, um, the measurements only get you so far. Um, and when it comes to, for instance, the, the design, the, the concept behind the design of the loudspeaker crossover, there are a number of different points of view about how that should be done all the way from uh, simple, you know, single pole filter slopes with very broad overlaps to 24 dB mm -hmm. per octave slopes and, and everything in between. There are a number of different, very well reasoned um, arguments for how to do it one way or another. And John's wide up, wound up uh, trying most <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, yes. But uh, this is then where I'm able to come in and, and, uh, and help him 
make uh, judgments about what's really working and what isn't. And, uh, uh, and that's led to an extraordinarily um, good sounding, uh, phenomenal sounding uh, system. Oh, thank you. Yeah, which does embody a lot of the qualities of live music. I think we can all agree that whether we're talking about a home system or a car system, um, it never sounds the same as it does when we're listening to live music in a club yeah. or whatever venue that is. Um, and it's, it's extremely difficult and some would argue impossible to really <laughs> to translate that fully and accurately into home or car. But we try to, to honor those values, the, that sense of liveness and, and the kind of um, balances and sound we hear um, under the right circumstances in, in live concerts. And uh, um, I feel you've succeeded uh, very well. Wow. Thank you. At that, uh, it's been a lot of work, um, a tremendous effort, but um, well, uh, it's paid off in, at least in the sense that you've achieved the goals you set out for yourself. This is uh, much more ambitious than most people <laughs> would have chosen to take on, um, but uh, it, it's uh, it's a remarkable piece of work. Thank you. But I can uh, I can assure the uh, readers of Car Audio and Electronics magazine if you hear the Magic Bus and you like it. You really need to hear Steve's system at home to know what a really good system sounds like. Um, the car faces a lot of obstacles and challenges, um, which are physical constraints that really can't exactly. be overcome. Exactly. And, um, in the home, uh, we have the luxury of having more control over the room and um, how the music is presented in that room, and it mm -hmm. and it goes even one step closer to the live experience which which is thrilling um so that i and i think that speaks to my uh, opinion um or i would say the the most fundamentally the most important part of your audio playback system is the room that you're in um you can argue about equipment all you want <laughs> uh, but unless you're in a good room to begin with uh, no matter how good your equipment is, you're you're faced with difficulties that may be um, insurmountable. But you're going to have problems making good sound. The better the room is to begin with, um, the better even mediocre equipment will sound in that room. And in in John's case, he's taken uh, this uh, uh, Mercedes Sprinter van, and uh, he's done an incredible amount of work. Um, on the electronics part of it and the speaker design and installation part of it, but he's done at least as much work on the acoustics of the van, um, the fundamental um, mechanical integrity and damping of the structure of the van, and then the control of the um, uh, impulse response and decay and, ba and evenness of the bass performance. That's taken a lot of work with uh, custom designed absorbers and traps and uh, uh, a, a lot of um, custom uh, acoustic treatment work, not electronic. This is before all that's done is getting the fundamentals of the space correct before then translating that into uh, uh, whatever other corrections need to be made for the uh, system itself. So the room um, whether you're talking about a home room or, or a car is a, uh, a very fundamental factor in determining the kind of sound you ultimately get. Um, and I guess, you know, that's maybe that's one of the reasons I stuck more with home audio than with car audio is, uh, sure. home always seemed a more natural environment to create good sound, uh, or goods, up goods, a relative term, obviously, um, uh, when I say that, I mean more lifelike, more realistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get into a typical car, even a good custom install, it can be a lot of fun. It can sound really good in a in an enjoyment sense, um, but I wouldn't characterize it as uh, natural or accurate typically. Um, but that's that's it isn't necessarily important. I mean, that's that's uh, those values are in the ear of the beholder. And as long as the owner of that car system is happy with the result, that's all that really counts. But we're we're kind of both John and I have been shooting for um, a little more difficult goal, you might say, which is is coming 
uh, trying to come closer to some sort of more um, natural realism. I hesitate to use the term accuracy because that's always a very difficult um, term to work with. Um, but uh, I'm talking about the, the sense in which the, our systems embody kind of the spirit uh, and the energy and the involvement of what we hear in good live music. Yeah, that, that hit, hit it right on the head. I mean, the car, I, my understanding of the statistics of the amount of time people spend in a car is something like 87 minutes a day. On average, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Of, <clears throat> Some that's poor a lot folks of have a long, yeah, couple hour commute or something. Yeah, especially in California. Yeah, so you want to be rocking down the highway, man, and enjoying your tunes while you're doing it. Yeah, and there, there's so much fun, um, and so much fun to be had with car audio. I think, and mm -hmm. if you have a hard day at work and you get in your car and you you sort of forget about the traffic jam and the time and. You sort of get lost in the music and I've heard a yeah. lot of people make that comment where they um, they get a huge amount of enjoyment out of uh, listening to music in their car and it helps them while away the time and makes yeah. you know makes the time pass in a much more congenial kind of way and uh, that's a heck of a good reason for investing in a good car system if that um, you know if that's what you need to to make the cares of the day melt away and and relax and groove on your way home or wherever you're going, then that's an awfully good argument for uh, putting a good system in your car. And the other thing about the car audio systems that I've found to be um, so enjoyable, the fact that uh, it they're very challenging to install. There's a there's in some yeah, cases no there uh, you know there's a lot of craftsmanship involved. Um, certainly the budget is shaped to the the individual. Right. Uh, cap, you know capabilities or desires of the of the individual um generally it's funner you know the bigger your budget is that of goes, course <laughs> goes with most things yeah but it's, you, know, you know i think i think there's a a, a parallel here with high-end audio yeah. as i see it home audio um in the sense that you don't have to spend a, a really a lot of money right to get something that is that is arguably high-end that you know speaks to that set of values um, you know, you, uh, for a few thousand dollars, you can put together a really nice system, whether it's for home or for car. Yeah. yeah. But beyond that, the sky's the limit. It's, <laughs> it's whatever your level of interest and your budget um, can sustain and, and uh, what, you know, where, where you decide to draw the line. And that's the fun part of the hobby for a lot of people um, is, uh, you know, you keep pushing things forward, um, keep seeing how much better it can be. And my, my personal experience, and I think many people's, is once you're exposed to high-end audio, uh, or, or just good audio in general, uh, you start out with a system and you enjoy it. And it gives you years of enjoyment. It's mm -hmm. reliable and it gives you the enjoyment every day. And um, whether you come home after work and listen to it in the evening or you listen to a system in your car on the way home from work, or the way to work, um, gives you so much enjoyment, so much reliability. You know, in this world that we live in with complexity mm -hmm. of things that, you know, break or give you problems, I think an audio system is one of those rare, wonderful things that still remains that gives you virtually no problems whatsoever. I mean, I've had car audio systems that I've done nothing to them for five years mm -hmm. and a home audio system that I've done nothing to it for 14 years or, or more. And it gives you that so much reward, so much enjoyment that oftentimes when you feel like you're into this uh, hobby, you feel like, wow, the next time I'm going to do this, I'm going to take it to the next level because I love it so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, um, I think we all, you know, as audiophiles, um, really like that aspect of, of how rewarding and uh, worthwhile audio is, um, relative well, to it, some other exactly. Things. It's yeah. a fun hobby that we both enjoy, and then the the ultimate payoff is the music that yeah. that we love. Um, so. You know, there are some people who are perfectly content listening to a table radio <laughs> at home and they love music that way for, you know, for us and 
and for I'm sure the uh, the readership uh, of the magazine, um, our interest goes beyond that. We want <laughs> you know something that's much more capable and expresses a lot more of uh, what's going on in the music. Um, but um, that's where the you know where we enjoy the hobby aspect of it. But ultimately, it's all about uh, listening to music, which is one of the greatest art forms that we've got. Maybe since we're talking about enjoyment and budgets, maybe we could hit on a topic that a lot of people talk about, which when you're assembling a system, do you have some thoughts on the prioritization of, you know, where your budget might go? Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a limited budget and you, you're trying to put together, say, a good look you know, let's keep it in the context of, well, car home, it's the same, maybe it's kind of the... Well, I suspect that there are yeah. some similarities. Yeah, similar. Um, Do you have any thoughts on that? Like what? Well, I've expressed my opinions about the nature of the room, but for a lot of us, whether we're talking car or home, yeah. we, we have a room, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of stuck with whatever that is. Yeah. To the extent that you can do anything to improve on the acoustics of the room or the car or whatever, I think that pays off in spades, but after that, you, you got to buy equipment to stick in there. Um, so I would say the you know the order of priorities after that is the speakers, um, and that I suppose is a very different can of worms. Whether you're talking about a car <coughs> or a home, home people are typically if it's a stereo, they're talking about a pair of speakers. Uh, maybe it's a surround sound system where they're dealing with five or more. Um, but those are generally speaking off the shelf ready-made speaker systems they're buying from somebody who's already done all the work to do the design um, car uh, gear i know that there are ready-made speakers but generally people are putting multiple drivers in different places within the car mm -hmm. uh, and and then all of those have to be uh, merged together somehow um, controlled so that it, the, the net effect is, is giving them what they want. Um, so I think that there's a much more uh, custom aspect to the speaker, the, the speaker system design and integration in the car than what you'd see in the home. In the home, we're typically worried about where to put the speakers, how mm -hmm. to set them up, uh, where they go in the room and making adjustments with that. Um, but we're dealing with a fixed, a box, you know, mm -hmm. or something of that nature. Uh, that's a defined system in a, in a car. You're often dealing with separate elements, different drivers, crossovers, and maybe even multiple amplifiers and things to get it all to work. But, but that's the most important thing. After that, you're looking at the amplification to drive the, um, the speaker, um, and you, you need to have adequate amplification regardless of what the speaker system is to drive it, um, the nature of that load electrically and also to drive it to whatever levels you choose to listen to <laughs> without distorting or straining the amplifier. Um, then you're dealing with control systems and source pieces and it's very difficult to separate those things out in terms of degree of importance. I'm not sure that you really can, uh, but there's a favorite argument that a lot of people uh, bring up, which is that um, uh, the source is extremely important because any, if anything goes wrong there, you can't correct it later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you can argue that different ways, but I think it's a reasonable argument. The sure. source is, is a key thing. Um, in home audio, audiophiles are paying a lot of uh, care in trying to choose something that will play the media that they want, but then synergizes, you know, has a, a sonic character that fits with uh, the rest of their equipment in a way that makes them happy. I think in car audio, and you may correct me if I'm wrong about this, but um, I, I think it's more feature driven um you're going to have a front end that plays back cds and music files somehow sure, or other sure. probably has a radio built into it sure and after that it's a question of what degree of functionality it has what degree of control it has what kind of user interface right, right. does it have um and it's got to fit in your particular car um so 
they they have a, a a set of choices that I think are partly defined by the car itself. Yeah. Um, and then it's a, a question of uh, budget and features and what you know what how that all fits together. Yeah, and the car has the further complication of perhaps wanting uh, navigation and Bluetooth uh, mixed in with the audio. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of choices to be made um, in that regard. Yeah, and in that sense, that maybe it. it may be very different for car yeah. uh, hobbyist uh, builders than for home But you would people. say for car, you would say loudspeaker selection and then maybe uh, placement of the loudspeakers. And if you could throw, throw a budget, I mean, everybody has to decide what proportion of their budget. Could, would, could you throw a, a useful guideline out or is I, it? I, no, I don't think no, in those okay. terms. So I... Okay. I, I don't know uh, uh, what to say about that. Um, again, I know that there's a curve of diminishing returns, as there is for all of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so once you've gone past a few thousand dollars, I don't know, you know, what what could we say arbitrarily, five thousand dollars or something. Once once you've hit that level, you should have some very good equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can probably you can arguably get good things below that point. Uh, but going above that point, there's a lot to choose from. You can spend a lot more than that, but you, you've started to move along the curve of diminishing returns so that you have to spend a relatively large amount of money to get a relatively small increase mm -hmm. in, in performance. Uh, and then again, that just it's up to the individual to, to choose where they want to draw the line, how much money they care to spend, and, and how to place the emphasis of Mm -hmm. How to spend that money? Um, there are there are some uh, car audio um, folks who believe that amplification is just amplification, and it's like watts per dollars. And I thought maybe as an amplifier designer, especially uh, one of of your stature, especially with unique designs and things, what what could you share with the readers of the magazine about your thoughts regarding amplification? And its importance, and maybe the differences between you know amplifiers and and what what do they really mean in the overall um, you know experience of the of, hmm. you know the audio. Ex Obviously, it's an important part of it because otherwise you wouldn't be you know engaged in that activity. Um, but uh, there are some you know they're the same sort of folks who believe that wire is wire and amplifiers are. You know, if they're well designed and basically functioning reasonably well, they're essentially the same and don't really matter. Uh, you know, they yeah. they kind of fall into that objective measurement sort of group of people, mm -hmm. and they sort of, you know, um, wonder about the you know the other side of things. Well, okay. Um, my experience tells me that there are differences, um, inherent differences in different designs and how they, how they actually sound. Um, so uh, I'm, um, I lean toward the subjective side of things in that regard. Um, I think regardless of how well something is designed, it does have some sonic character of its own. Sure. It but um, you know, in a home environment, um, you know, I can go in there and change out the amplifier in my system quite easily. It's, it's sitting out on a separate um, platform and I have ready access to it. Uh, I think when people are doing custom car installations, uh, part of some of their choices involve physical location and installation of this gear. Yeah. And it makes it very difficult to do any experiments after the fact, once you've decided what you're gonna put in there and you do the installation, changing to something else unless it had exactly the same physical form factor. It's going to be very difficult. So any uh, listening choices usually would have to be done beforehand. And uh, perhaps there are dealerships that set things up in such a way that you can switch between them and make some sort of choice on this basis. But OK, let's face it, we're talking about when we're talking about the differences sonically, whatever they may be between amplifiers, these things are relatively subtle, mm -hmm. all right? Yes, I hear them, I, I believe that they're real, but um, if, we, if we look at the differences in sound among speakers, that's on a completely different order of magnitude. 
Um, so those, those are relatively large differences, whereas you take any competently designed amplifier and the differences will be relatively small. They may be meaningful to some people, um, but it's a different order of scale of things. Sure. Um, so in the car environment, I think um, the, the choices you make for the speaker drivers and how they're installed um, and how, what crossover points are used. And uh, all those choices, I think, um, weigh a lot more heavily in the final outcome than whether you choose amplifier A, B, or C. As long as those amplifiers are competently designed, do hit the basic benchmarks of required performance, will um, power your speakers adequately and and won't be driven into mm -hmm. instability or clipping or you know have some real problem as a function of being connected to the wrong load or something wrong with the uh, uh, with the speaker design. So, um, I you know I of course you know more, you're more in tune with the car industry than I am. Do you hear people within the car industry talking about sound quality differences between amplifiers and cars? Yeah, there's, there's a couple different camps, you know, just like, uh, and that'll probably take us to the next and maybe final question about okay. the duality of audio uh, or, you know, audiophile in the audio industry. But yeah, there are some people who um, believe that a certain brand of amplifier sounds much better than the next okay. brand of amplifier. Um, but then I think it, it's commonly understood that implementation means a great deal yeah you bet and uh you know you could like you said if if the loudspeaker system is not performing at its optimum certainly it's going to diminish the amplifier so that mm -hmm. certainly there's this synergistic of you know approach but, but then there are some other folks who are a little more you know objectively based or at least claim to be and uh and they think that, you know, wire is wire and amplifiers are well, amplifiers. Okay. I, all of this, in my estimation, boils down ultimately to our experience in listening to this gear. So I have no particular axe to grind one way or the other <laughs> here. I would urge um, the, the viewers here to experiment for themselves. I think we all have to, to come to these conclusions on our own. Um, you, you know, you can read what other people have to say. But the truth is, as you probably already know, you will find divergent opinions on just about <laughs> any questions yes. you care to raise. Um, so my my point is, give it a try. If you have the opportunity and you can listen to a couple of different amplifiers or different cables, see what you hear. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if you feel that you do hear a difference and it's worthwhile and it makes sense to you, then you know, spend the money for that cable or that amplifier or whatever it is, and don't let anybody try to tell you that you've made a bad choice if you feel that you've heard something worthwhile there. Because if you don't, then fine, stick you know, buy something on the basis of its size or shape or cost or or whatever. Um, but until you try it for yourself and you make some listening comparisons you won't know for sure. And I know that, I, I understand that intuitively, it would seem to make sense that wires shouldn't matter and um, amplifiers that measure the same should sound the same and all of that. Um, I don't find that to be the case, but what do you find? Yeah. You know, go, go yeah. listen for yourself and see what you think. Uh, because in the end, that's what matters. And uh, uh, it, I, I think that car people are fighting an uphill battle in that regard because I think they have less opportunity, I'm guessing. Yeah. But I think it's it's more difficult to find places where you can make these kind of comparisons in it a is. way that would have any validity at all and and um, in a way that would relate to what's gonna what it's gonna be like when you actually get it in the car. Um, but um, if you do have an opportunity, I urge you to to give it a try and, and see what you think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's valuable advice for sure. Uh, it's it, everything in in my estimation is talk 
until you actually hear the results. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's true, though, that you can't actually test all of the variables beforehand. So you are making some, right. you know, some accommodations uh, when you choose a particular product and choose to implement it in the car. And, right. Uh, so, yeah, it, that's a frustrating limitation because it, it, then once you've chosen it, it's not easy to swap out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think if you make, well, do, you know, do some due diligence, do some background yeah. work. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure all of you do. You read reviews, you sure. read other people's opinions, you try to gather useful information before you make a, a buying choice. That's, you know, that's pretty much the best you can do. Um, in home audio, as I say, you know, it's a little easier to swap stuff out, whether mm -hmm. it's amplifiers or cables or whatever. Um, and this is something that audiophiles, of course, love to do. It's a part of the hobby. Uh, bring home new equipment, get together with friends, try out different, you know, listen to different stuff. Um, and uh, usually there are differences to be heard. Then you get to argue over whether you're... <laughs> who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so when, we're, we're always arguing about something. Yeah, what I find interesting, and a lot of people come to me for advice about which components to choose and how to install them and things. And well, my advice is to make the installation a, a little bit more universally adaptable than you may think is necessary because things can change. Products can come and go and... Mm -hmm. um, maybe your listening uh, tastes change or maybe your system goals change and you want to be, be able to have the system change with you uh, rather than to be uh, painted into a corner you know with your system choice and um, and it you know it also maybe points to the fact that it is really important to take the time to choose the component properly because in the car you you may have to live with it longer than uh, right than other you know applications like the home for instance where right. the component can just be taken out and replaced yeah. exactly right so this this touches on another topic probably the final question okay yeah i think uh, let's move on to the last question and wrap this up for yeah. our folks in the we we talked about you know amplifiers and wire and stuff but there's also duality and different camps in the audio industry there's you know analog versus digital tubes versus solid state horns versus dynamic drivers you know and the list goes on and on and on and um and it the passion that each person you know emotes for these different things is is fascinating mm -hmm. and one and a wonderful aspect of the uh, hobby but What's your take on all of this? You know, what does it come down to the just the listening enjoyment or what what is it for you? That... Well, other than, you know, like the analog and digital thing is a fundamental shift in, in technology itself. Yeah. Um, everything else is pretty much just a, a matter of a, of a point of view. It's a personal perspective on, on the hobby and it's based on some personal experience, some preference in the listening experience. Um, so that's what it all boils down to. I guess I don't see these things as dualities or dichotomies yeah. so much as they are just part of a continuum of within the hobby, um, all the way from, you know, electrostatic or planar type loudspeakers versus dynamic ones and their relative merits, uh, to tu tubes versus, uh, solid state electronic design. Um, and, you know, vinyl LPs versus CDs versus computer <laughs> file playback. And, and on and on and on. Every part of this hobby has its proponents and its detractors, and and I guess that's what keeps life interesting. If we all agreed on everything, it would yeah. be uh, maybe it would be much more bland and uh, less interesting. Uh, but it doesn't look like we're in any danger of that happening <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so uh, it's a it's a hobby for enjoyment. Have you know? Have yeah. fun with it. Don't get too worked up about it don't worry too much about other people's opinions form your own opinions it's uh, you're the one that's that's living with this gear that's consuming what it does the you know the act of making music you're the one that's got to be happy and satisfied and in that respect it's your opinion that counts more than anyone else's so 
um, formulate your own opinions and trust your judgment and don't let anybody tell you you're wrong. Yeah, that's good advice. Steve, thanks for spending some time with us today to discuss uh, uh, matters of audio and relating both to the car and the home. And uh, appreciate your time. And it was an oh, you're more than You're more than welcome. It's my pleasure. And um, thanks again to, uh, to Ben O of uh, Car Audio and Electronics Magazine for giving us the opportunity to uh, present this information to you folks. And speaking of that, Ben, ben O will be at the Magic Bus uh, Car and Home Audio Expo on April 23rd and 24th. I invite the readers of Car Audio and Electronics Magazine to, to join us in the celebration, uh, to audition the Magic Bus, bring your favorite recordings. I'll have some of my own, some high res, uh, otherwise you can listen to your own recordings. You can learn more about the Magic Bus at WhitledgeDesigns.com. And if you want to learn more about uh, Steve's work, at you, can, you can come to my website at smcaudio.com. And if you're a, a lover of jazz and you want to check out some of Jim Murad's recordings, which also includes some of Steve's mixing and mastering and editing work. Uh, quite a lot, in fact, yes. And uh, visit blueportjazz.com. That's blueportjazz.com. So this is John Whitledge signing and, off. And Steve McCormick saying goodbye. And by the way, uh, Steve will be at the uh, Car Audio or Car and Home Audio Expo available to listen to your car audio system, offer uh, some suggestions for improvement, um, and surely you want to take, be there and take advantage of that opportunity. I'm looking forward to being there and um, meeting all of you fine folks. Come on down and join us. We hope to see you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.